In this video, I will be building and flying a Super Atlas, also known as the Odyssey. And it will be the first time in Kerbal Gets Real Redux that we will be able to launch a heavy satellite. Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real Redux. It is 1956, we are now six years into our campaign, and there are going to be some heavy things launched over the course of this year. Oh, and also, maybe completing the heavy satellite program? One thing that we won't be seeing over the course of this episode, though, is planes. This is the first episode that I've done of this series that does not feature an X-plane on the thumbnail. And that's because, really, right now, I need to wait for technology to unlock in order to progress that program even further. The X-15 cockpit is my limitation, and that will be researched by the end of this year. And unfortunately, I can't really do hypersonic flight or the Kármán line without that tech, without killing anyone. The next major event to come up, though, is 1958 orbital rocketry being unlocked in February. This is going to be a very useful node because it contains the Gamma Engine, something I am quite familiar with with my experience of it in For All Kerbal Kind. Not only does it give me access to those engines though, I can now upgrade the LR89 and the LR105. So I go in and make a quick edit to Odyssey to give me the best engine for that vehicle as possible. The engine upgrades aren't terribly expensive and I'm able to cover the costs using my research credits. Then once again it's just balancing my staffing, bringing my total engineers up to 320 with 310 of them in the Odyssey complex. This should now mean that it only takes me about 90 days to build one of those vehicles, and that means we're going to get to see three of them launched this year. So on the 7th of April 1956, the first Odyssey is finished, and its payload Constellation 1. This is going to be my first ever heavy satellite, and I aim to complete two contracts with this launch. First biological satellite, and first scientific satellite. But before we get to the payload, let me tell you a little bit about the Odyssey rocket, or the Super Atlas, because I mean, it basically is an atlas, just bigger. There are some small differences though, in that this doesn't use stage and a half staging. No, I do use boosters on the side, and because of that, that, well, that's why it's a Super Atlas. In order to make this thing not look completely ridiculous and have one tiny core stage surrounded by two massive boosters, well, I needed to use four LR-105 engines on the first stage. You know, the one where only one of them was used on the Atlas. That is flanked by two LR-89 boosters, the normal amount of LR-89s you would find on an Atlas. I mentioned it in a previous episode, but over the course of this series, I do not want to be using real-life designs. I am obviously going to have to use engines from real-life designs because the game is going going to limit me to that, but I don't want to make them look like the real thing. I want to get a little bit creative. Having four LR-105s on the first stage does mean that this can lift over one ton of payload, which is perfect for completing the two contracts that I mentioned earlier. Not only this, but it can lift much more. I can't remember off the top of my head at the moment, but I'm fairly sure this rocket in this configuration can lift about two tons to low Earth orbit. That's going to be absolutely fantastic for lunar impactors, orbiters, and potentially even landers later on down the line, and probably even further, well, I know about this because I have used it, but this vessel will be capable of sending my first probes into planetary too. The LR-89s, which are in the NA-3 configuration, are burnt for their full length, and separated once there is no fuel remaining. Then the absolutely ginormous 3 meter core stage carries on to space, but there is also an upper stage as well. Another advantage over the Atlas is that this does have a third stage. Obviously, later variants of the Atlas did have Centaur, but this has a Russian X-plane engine. We'll get to that in a minute. One of the LR-105s did unfortunately fail. Now, this isn't the worst thing in the world because it is able to still fire in the right direction. There are four engines after all, and they have enough gimbal to counter that failed engine. The engine never actually lit in the first place. It failed from launch. I do get a bit of data from this, but it would have been nicer to have it fire the entire way. Still, as I said, this is overbuilt to launch one ton, so it doesn't really matter that one of them failed. It will just take a little bit longer to get to orbit. They do complete the burn, and the second stage fails. One of the S-155s, yes, the Soviet rocket interceptor engine, fails to ignite, causing this to go into an uncontrollable spin. These engines do not have gimbal at all, which is why I have RCS on this stage to control it, and if both were to fire, it would be more than capable of maintaining its attitude, which if you ask me is a pretty poor one right now. Alas, with just one, this thing is dead, not even in space. And unfortunately, Constellation 1 was a failure. 
Well, it had been a while since Test Flight reared its ugly head, and I was bound to get something come up sooner rather than later. Although, that being said, that was rather inconvenient, as now that is going to push my completion of the Heavy Satellites program back by at least three months. Anyway, whilst waiting for the next Odyssey to be complete, which will be roughly at the end of July, Thierry finishes his proficiency training in the X-15, something that I started him on at the beginning of the year. Then, in May, Lunar Range Communications Technology is unlocked, and I purchased the Tracking Station upgrade. Had the first Odyssey been a success, I would have liked to have gotten a lunar flyby by the end of the year, but now that's rather doubtful. However, I do still want to pick up that upgrade because I am going to be going to the moon very shortly. The upgrade is a little costly, but moving it down to a work rate of 35% in the construction menu means that I am only losing about 17 funds a day. Clearly not ideal, but with over 7,000 funds in the bank, it's not really a concern right now because Odyssey rockets only cost about 6,500. So by the time I need to build another one, I will have enough funding. And having that at 35% will mean that I get that building finished by the end of the year. The date rolls around to August though and that means it's time to try and launch a second scientific satellite. Hopefully this time it succeeds. On the 3rd of August, Constellation 2 has been completed and once again mounted on top of an Odyssey launch vehicle. Currently we are 0 for 1 with the reliability of this launch vehicle. That's not a good percentage. Even though the engines on this rocket are somewhat reliable, the fact that there are so many of them does make it prone to failure. More chances of failure means it's more likely to happen. However, the rocket is launched again and this time round, rather than talking about the rocket, I'm going to talk about how I launched this because finally I am able to use MechJeb Ascent Guidance. I know I have been told that you can use it for unguided kick stages now, but this is something that I didn't do, and this was something I only found out after I filmed all of this. But now this rocket is completely guided, and that means I can use Ascent Guidance, and that is wonderful for so many reasons. The most important one being I can leave my computer and go and do my daily chores, like look after my cats, scratch my cat's bellies, get attacked by my cats for scratching their bellies, giving my cats food, and just playing with them. I'm not really sure if those are my daily chores, that's something that I probably just like doing. Aside from that, another bonus with using Mech Jeb Ascent Guidance is that I can get cinematic shots of launches every time. I'm not going to be doing that every time because this series is not meant to be a fully cinematic series. A lot of this is meant to be me going through the new RP1 PNLC update and talking about how it is and showing you in depth what I'm actually doing to progress this save. However, it is nice to get cinematics every now and then, especially once I've launched a launch vehicle so many times that I don't really have that much to say about it anymore. By the end of this episode, we will have had three launches of the Odyssey launch vehicle. That's quite a lot. And to be honest, I'm not even sure what I'm going to talk about in the last launch. Maybe the payload. That seems like a good idea. This time round, there is no failure on any of the six engines that are lit on the ground. Both LR-89s and all four LR-105s burn fully to completion. And then with bated breath, I staged for the S-155 stage. And this did make me very nervous. But fortunately, this time round, both engines did fire. Now, the S-155 may seem like a weird choice to use for an upper stage engine, but there are a few reasons for this. It doesn't require ullage, so I can leave this coast for a bit if I really wanted to, which I'm not really going to do, and it's an engine that I can light in the air that has a reasonable amount of thrust on it, and if I am going to want to launch one ton and heavier payloads, I need that thrust. I could go for, say, an AJ-10, but that thing is really weak. The Delta V I get from this stage, even with a one ton payload on top, is still pretty nice, getting about 3,000 meters per second when this stage starts. Now, the biggest downside to this engine though, as mentioned in the last fly, is it doesn't have any gimbal. It means I can't steer this spacecraft at all unless I use the RCS, which is why I have copious amounts of RCS on this stage. I am using HTP configuration for the RCS because that stuff is a lot denser than nitrogen, so it means I can pack a lot more in those small tanks on the side. And the amount of RCS I have on here doesn't really negatively affect my Delta V all that much when getting to space, but it is required if you want to use an engine like this that doesn't have gimbal. Anyway, the two S 155s burn to completion, and that means I have got a scientific satellite in low Earth orbit. The contract requirements for this needed a highly elliptical orbit, meaning that my apogee had to go over 1,500 kilometers. This is a scientific satellite, and really, what this is going to be searching for is finding out more information about the Van Allen belts, and that is something that is included in this save because I am playing with Kerbalism and it models them, which is a really nice addition if I'm going to be honest, and it does look very cool on the map view. Now, in order to make the 
Constellation probe heavier than one tonne, a lot of electric charge was needed. And that's good because it means I can fully run pretty much every experiment that I have unlocked at the moment. The only one I am unable to do for that length of time is the magnetometer experiment because that thing draws electric charge incredibly quickly. But I do have a micrometeorite detector on here as well as the cosmic ray science experiment and that is going to bring me in a lot of science over the next 90 days. And that's going to be wonderful because I was actually running out of technologies to research. So I may have been a little bit wrong about that mission, and we have actually discovered that Van Allen belts exist, as is made evident by this newspaper. That does unfortunately mean we are going to have to provide our Kerbals with radiation protection if I do want to go beyond them, because the sun is a deadly laser. Now at this point in my career, I made another mistake. At least I think it may have been a mistake. I now could technically finish the heavy satellites program, but I did not realise this. I thought I had to do all three contract requirements, but when I go and complete it later, which will happen in this episode, I noticed you only needed to do either the polar launch or the biological launch. And I've already done the biological launch, which means I have fully satisfied that program's requirements. I did not do this because I thought, yeah, you had to do all three. This meant that I could have started working on my lunar and commercial satellites program right now. But instead, I stick with the heavy satellites because there was still one more contract to complete. Only having 5,000 funds, I'm not able to build a new Odyssey yet. And with a bit of finagling of the construction menu, I am able to get more funding a day and get another Odyssey built up that will fly before the end of the year. After building the Odyssey, I was able to move the tracking station construction up to 40%, which means it will be done by the 24th of December. So it does mean I could have flown a lunar mission and still had comms by the end of this year. Another reason why maybe it would have been a good idea to start going lunar. But with Constellation 2, now having been in orbit for many days, I did get quite a nice gain of science. I'm now at 19 science points. So I go into research and development and pick up 1958 solid rocket engines, as well as 1959 orbital rocketry. 59 orbital rocketry, another great tech node because that gives me the parts for Titan. Not that I'm going to be building a Titan, but the engines, the LR-91 and the LR-87 are really good, especially as I have been somewhat sticking to American first stage engines so far, so hopefully that means they should be a little bit cheaper to unlock. Purchasing earlier American engines will make future American purchases a little bit more cheaper, it's just one of the ways that RP-1 works. With the tech purchased, I then go and upgrade the administration building in the hopes that I will be able to pick up more programs later on. Not going for the right now, I decide to move the tracking station back down to 0% and focus on working on the admin building instead. Completing that first means I'll be able to pick up another program next time I get to choosing one. And with one of them being the lunar program, I really wanted the admin building done before I go to the moon. Then it's just a quick warp to December to fly the final constellation mission of this episode. On the 6th of December 1956, the last flight of this episode, yes I know we've only had three and that does mean that this episode is going to be a bit shorter than a normal one, Constellation 3 is flown and this time we are going polar. And because of that, that does mean that the payload on top of this Odyssey vehicle is slightly different from the last couple that I launched. Doing a polar launch does require about 400 or so meters per second more of delta V, it might even be more than that, but it's definitely more than if you were just to launch due east. So the payload on top of this vehicle has been made lighter. Rather than having a huge one ton satellite, it is considerably smaller, but it does have more science that I am able to gain. I have attached a television camera to this because with the amount of electric charge on this, I should be able to fully cover the entire Earth, every single biome with that experiment. I did launch a polar television camera in the last episode, but it did not have much battery power at all, so wouldn't have been able to cover everywhere. This, however, being launched on the much larger Odyssey vehicle will have sufficient battery. Not only that, but it does also have solar panels, so it will be able to recharge its battery if experiments aren't being run. The launch goes off completely successfully and I am able to get Constellation 3 up into low Earth orbit in a polar inclination. The probe on this I did spend a little bit more time designing than the previous two probes and this is something that I am going to be doing going further in this series. The first two probes that I launched this episode were basically just glorified cones. I want to make my probes look a little bit more interesting and really they weren't interesting the first time around at all. That's because I didn't spend nearly enough time on designing them. This one has a few greebles, a few bits and bobs, and it looks a lot more exciting. I don't only have the television camera on here, I also have the magnetometer. So this is something that I said I did not have on top of the last vessel, and that's because it does draw a lot of electric charge, and it is also very heavy. But I thought I might get a bit of magnetic science if I launched with one of these, and I do. I get it all, because even with that magnetometer running, with the solar panels, this probe is going to have more than 100 days worth of battery, and that experiment takes 30 days, so definitely something that will be completed. That's also going to be another 14 science, which will allow me to pick up a new technology too. But yeah, not really much more to say about that launch. The polar contract is completed and I'm going to be gaining more science. 
Back at the Space Center and after having finished that contract, it was time to go in and finish early Satellites Heavy. Now, with hindsight, I know I could have finished this earlier, but this was me finishing it now. I did um and ah about my progression from here because I could have gone for crude orbit, which would have meant that I would have had to have completed that before record time. However, I wasn't sure if I had the science necessary to push for that that early. So instead, I went for early lunar probes at breakneck speed and early commercial applications at far speed. I would have gone for breakneck, but I did not have the confidence. And because early Earth observation satellites only takes up one slot, as soon as my admin building is finished being upgraded, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick that up next year because it's not going to be until next year that that upgrade completes. With those two programs picked up, my funding goes up quite dramatically and I'm able to ramp up construction of the tracking station again. This is something I will need in order to go to the moon for a couple of reasons. It allows me to make maneuver nodes, although I'm not sure if Principia would allow me to do that anyway, and it also allows me to talk with my probes once they arrive at the moon. Then I go into mission control and notice that lunar flyby uncrewed will gain me 75 applicants. Those are free staff members. So I want to get that done as soon as possible to really ramp up my space center's production. With a bit more science gained from that last launch, I also pick up 1959 to 1960 rocket engines. This will unlock me the Altai Air solid rocket engine, which is going to be very nice for kick stages to the moon. Something I most likely am going to be doing because that will require a smaller launch vehicle to actually get me to the moon. Having nothing currently being constructed and having picked up hypersonic flight, it was high time that I built my Kármán line X plane. And I went into the space plane hangar and worked on the AS, the Altitude Science Plane. At least I think that's what the acronym was for. That unfortunately won't be built until January next year, but that is something that will be happening next year in 1957. I will hopefully be completing the X plane program. I now have all the tech, I have the designs that will complete it, and I'm quite excited to finish that off. After this, I go into the VAB and purchase the toolings and parts for Spark 1, which is going to be my first lunar impactor. Well, lunar flyby and lunar impactor. Unfortunately though, I cannot afford to build it yet. And even warping ahead to the end of December with the two buildings that I have currently being upgraded set to 5% didn't give me enough funding to build it. However, I did notice I still had four planes in storage and scrapping three of those was enough to put me up to eight and a half thousand thumbs, more than enough to build the next Odyssey and take me to the moon. I also went and picked up high speed flight, which to this day I still haven't completed. I keep pushing it back in the tech tree because I'm not using it. Not really sure why I spent 10 science points on that. There probably could have been a better investment. But anyway, we find ourselves on the 1st of January and this year is going to be a big one. We've got lunar flybys, impactors, maybe even an orbiter by the end, as well as trying to finish that X-plane program and some of those commercial applications. I imagine it's going to be a lot longer than this episode because I've looked at my footage already and there's a lot. There is an awful lot. However, that won't be coming out next week. I mentioned it in the last episode, but I am going to be taking a break this next next week because it's Christmas and it's my birthday and I really need to take a break. I've been working on this channel non-stop for the past four weeks. It is completely bleeding into any free time that I have. I tried to set myself real work hours for this and that hasn't worked out. I've ended up working way too late into the middle of the night. I've ended up sacrificing my weekends to produce these videos so I, I need a break to rest and recharge and recuperate. So no Kerbal Gets Real Redux episode on New Year's Eve. The next one will be coming back in the new year, most likely on the 7th of January. I still do plan streaming next weekend though and I might even do two streams, one on the Sunday where this episode would release and I'm thinking of streaming something for this series and my idea for that will be working on my first crude lunar lander. I am at that point in the save, I'm not going to be showing anything more than the design of that because I don't want to give away anything else about where I'm up to because you know that's 10 years from this episode so there would be quite a few spoilers but watch out for that next week, it hopefully should be a first fun stream to do for this series. A big Thanks to Redstone Wizard, Shadow Dev, Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Moss Config, Mr. Blue Star, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.